Okay, man. This is your time. Maybe you didn't choose this, but you're here now. You're gonna go out there and be an all-star caregiver. Cook, clean, be there emotionally and physically. You gotta dig deeper. Drive them to physical therapy, doctor's appointments, because that's what caregivers do. Don't give up. Show the world that you're tougher than tough. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. For the Washington Senators, under the guidance of freshman manager Ted Williams, wearing uniform number nine, Dale Unser will start it off. He'll lead off and play center field. Ed Stroud will be in right field, batting second. Frank Howard, who's 44 home runs last year, led the American League in that department and all of baseball. He'll bat third and play left. Mike Epstein will hit in the cleanup spot and play first base. Ken McMullen will play at third base and bat fifth. Hitting sixth and playing second, Tim Cullen. Ed Brinkman will be the shortstop, batting seventh. Paul Casanova will do the catching. He'll hit eighth. And Camilo Pasquale, who won 12 and lost 12 in 1968, will do the pitching and he'll bat ninth. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right, everybody, how you doing? It's uh, Tim Hanlon, and it's Good Seats Still Available, our curious podcast, our journey each and every week uh, into what used to be in professional sports. Hope you got your scorecards ready and your pencils sharpened. Because uh, there you just heard the uh, the opening day lineup, 1969 style for the Washington Senators, the team that uh, it was the second incarnation of that team. And it's our conversation this week as we circle around a year in that second uh, incarnation, 1969 to be exact, uh, with our guest this week, Steve Walker, uh, as we get into a very interesting and, and oftentimes overlooked season of the second version of the Washington Senators. Of course, this is the version of the team that wound up, well, expanding uh, for, for, to start in 1961 after the uh, previous uh, version of said franchise uh, moved to Minnesota in 1960 uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, some of which we'll get into in our conversation with Steve in just a few moments. Uh, the uh, Washington Senators' original franchise uh, absconded uh, to become the Twins, but uh, were hastily replaced with an expansion franchise the very next year, 1961. Uh, a number of different reasons for that, one of which is uh, the uh, battle cry of antitrust protection and, and perhaps removing such uh, various senators and uh, uh, Congress people and other people in the Washington area just uh, just upset, even though the team wasn't very well supported, uh, just sort of leaving in the middle of the night, if you will. Uh, a new team, voila, completely uh, separated and, and different and uh, having no relation to the team uh, that preceded it, uh, came onto the scene in 1961. We get into this second version, and yes, of course, in 1971, a mere 10 seasons later, uh, this team, of course, left Washington, D.C., this time to become the now Texas Rangers. But all that is uh, background and prelude, and it's uh, it's interesting stuff. But uh, we get into the one season that uh, the second version of the Senators actually had a winning season. Yeah, you know this uh, this team both uh, in both versions, the Senators, uh, Washington D.C. first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League. And of course, uh, that motto was uh, retrofitted and updated for this second version of the Senators uh, to uh, still last in the American League. A woeful team uh, in many respects, uh, and uh, the only winning season that uh, the Washington Senators version two had was in 1969. Uh, and a very special season as we get into with our conversation with Steve Walker in a few moments. And it uh, it kind of just uh, uh, gets into uh, you know one of the themes that we constantly uh, stumble across in our little investigation in teams and leagues, uh, childhood memories. And in this case, uh, Steve was uh, a mere pup, uh, eight, nine years old and, and going to his very first baseball game uh, growing up in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area and uh, falling in love and being transfixed and, and being impressionable. Uh, we, uh, here on this little show have, uh, uh, dealt with a lot of folks who've had sort of very young impressions that have lasted with them, including yours truly, by the way, New York Cosmos soccer fan. Right. But, uh, you know, unwittingly Steve, uh, was part of uh, a bit of 
a witness to history here because you had a team, the Washington Senators, that were brand new management, uh, in particular in the form of a guy named Ted Williams, uh, a legendary baseball uh, figure for sure, and uh, a Hall of Famer already uh, after having a, a, a legendary career in the Boston Red Sox organization. Uh, but here he was under uh, owner Bob Short's uh, tutelage, uh, was recruited to become manager uh, with no managerial experience and uh, a lot of buzz in uh, what was then called D.C. Stadium. It had yet to be uh, named RFK Stadium, uh, I think. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when RFK Stadium got its name, but I digress. The idea that Ted Williams, frankly, he, he was a, a splash, right? Certainly got some press. A lot of people got a lot of buzz about this team all of a sudden, even though people were overlooking the fact that Williams had no managerial experience. Uh, and as you heard in that clip there, that's, uh, by the way, for you Yankees fans out there, uh, that was uh, from the opening day game, the Yankees at the new Washington Senators, not new, but sort of under the uh, the new tutelage and the oversight of Ted Williams. Uh, and who was it? That was Jerry Coleman on WHN Radio uh, calling all the action for Yankees. Yeah, many people forget that Jerry Coleman, before he went on to his long run as the uh, uh, San Diego Padres broadcaster in his uh, standout career uh, as a player as well, called Yankees games. And that was uh, the uh, the broadcast uh, that you heard uh, with the opening day lineup for the Washington Senators under Ted Williams uh, and his uh, his leadership. And we get into a very interesting year this year, not just only a winning season, the only winning season of this second version of the Senators, uh, but frankly, a, a bit of um, a microcosm, if you will, of this franchise. We get into the story of Bob Short, uh, his ownership uh, and no, frankly, uh, friends uh, left uh, as he uh, kicked off the uh, the dust uh, from his shoes uh, and the rug as he uh, pulled that under Washington, D.C.'s uh, uh, house, if you will, moving to Texas. Uh, we get into some of the the players, uh, the uh, the uh, the fans and what it was like to be a, a Senators fan. And yeah, there were a bunch of them. Uh, the World Series, excuse me, not the World Series you wish, right? The All-Star Game being played uh, in Washington that year. Look, Ted Williams actually won Manager of the Year in 1969, even though the team itself finished in fourth place in the National, excuse me, in the American League East, he says. But that just shows you how woeful uh, the team was the previous year and, frankly, for most of the years uh, during their second incarnation. And we get into a very interesting, intriguing and, frankly, unexpected story of the Washington Senators 1969 style. Yeah, lots going on in the country, lots going on in the world, lots going on in D.C., lots going on in baseball. Uh, but the curious and very intriguing story of the Senators in 1969 with our guest, Steve Walker. He, by the way, the author of the book, A Whole New Ball Game, the 1969 Washington Senators. And uh, there's the 50th anniversary edition that just came out to last year, uh, remembering this team uh, and all the various interesting stories uh, that Steve and others, a lot of uh, interviews with people, players, and uh, and otherwise uh, in this story. We, we suss out a bunch of it. Uh, coming up in just a few moments with our guest, Steve Walker, as we talk 69 Senators Baseball and uh, before we do so, of course, we're going to get into our little uh, promotional uh, banter here for our friends this week at 503 Sports, 503-sports.com. Yes, Dustin Alameda, Portland, Oregon. That's the place and that's the site, 503-sports.com for all of your great sports reminiscences. Uh, they consider themselves, and rightly so, the king of throwbacks. Lots of great stories uh, to be memor uh, memorialized, frankly, in, in great clothing. Uh, T-shirts for sure, uh, but handcrafted, custom-made jerseys. Uh, and the, the Washington Senators are uh, are remembered in, in great style. If you want a 1970 uh, Senators jersey, uh, handcrafted and, again, custom-made, you want your number and your name on the back of it, uh, you can get that uh, at 503-sports.com. How about the Senators satin jacket? Those were quite the thing back in the day. Um, there's also the Senators alternate jersey. And even some earlier versions of Senators, I bet the 1957 previous version of the Senators jersey, all that and much, much more, not just in Senators garb, but all kinds of garb at 503 Sports. And again, that's 503-sports.com. And of course, a promo code awaits you uh, when you see that little box pop up after you've chosen all your uh, your items, Senators or otherwise. And that promo code is SEATS, S-E-A-T-S, plural, yes, SEATS. For 10% off all of your purchases at 503 Sports, the king of throwbacks. And again, that site, 
503-SPORTS. Don't forget the dash, 503-SPORTS.com. And uh, promo code is SEATS. We appreciate Dustin, uh, his team at 503 Sports. We appreciate you giving him a try and, of course, continuing to listen. Here comes our fun chat, our unexpectedly interesting well, I, I knew it was going to be interesting, but I learned a lot because, again, sort of you, you kind of stumble across like, OK, 1969, the Washington Senators. All right. Fairly middling uh, uh, season. Right. They finished some 20 some odd games behind the Baltimore Orioles, who won well over 100 games that season. Well, no, it was actually quite interesting because this was the year of Ted Williams and nobody expected anything from the Senators, and they had quite the buzz that year. And it's interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. Here we go. Here's our conversation with Steve we had just a couple of weeks back. Please, as always, enjoy the proceedings. So maybe to uh, get our audience warmed up, how do you uh, how does this sort of hit your radar? Like in what sort of personal or professional or just uh, uh, geographical, whatever, what, 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 why? Why this uh, situation? Why this year? And why this team? Sure. When I was um, five years old, my family moved from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to, um, to um, Arlington, Virginia. We lived in Colmore Apartments. And I started to hear about, you know, the D.C. teams, the you know, football with Sonny Jurgensen and and the, and the baseball team that had Frank Howard and, and the rest of them were terrible. And then we moved um, out to Centerville, Virginia, a couple of years later. And the family across the street from me were just rabid fans. So they got my dad um, to take me to some games uh, starting in 1969 to the Washington Senator games at RFK. And I was seven at the time. I mean, so you can imagine, you know, a little kid walking into to his first baseball game. And my first game was July 15th, 1969. Uh, thanks to RetroSheet, I looked that up because Tim Cullen hit uh, a very rare home run that game. And I was just hooked from there. And I really loved the Senators. And of course, you know, the sad part of the story is two years later, they moved away. And again, being a nine-year-old boy, that's you know, one of the most devastating things that can happen in your life if you're you know, blessed enough to have healthy parents and healthy brothers and sisters. So... Um, that got me hooked. And then about 1995, 96, when the government shutdown happened, I was working for the Commerce Department and I got a little bit nostalgic for those old days, um, you know, D.C. not having a team for so many years. And I started doing some research um, while I was shut down um, at home and at the uh, nearby library. And then when I went back to work at the Martin Luther King Library. Um, downtown DC, and it was just compelling these stories in this season. Um, and then I joined the DC Baseball History Society, and they put me in touch with some of the players. And unfortunately, almost all of them were still living, uh, and gave me some contact information to do interviews. And it just went from there. And the more I dug into it, the more um, the more fascinating the season was, uh, the more meaningful it was. And the big thing was the stories of redemption of so many of the players that kind of mirrored the story of the team. I mean, they were dismissed as the worst team in baseball bef before a game was even played in 1969. And then, you know, they end up uh, having their best season in DC since 1945. So the more I dug into it, um, I combined my nostal nostalgia with my sort of writer's nose for, for a great story. And those two things came together really well. And that's how the book came into being. Well, let's let's go back maybe to the childhood thing, because, uh, you know, I, I've been doing this uh, podcast for Jesus now approaching our fourth year now. And, uh, you know, I, going back and sort of going into my sort of uh, psychological profile, I guess, I mean, it, it does indeed start with and, and a lot of our listeners, not all of them. There are various curiosities and various reasons why people uh, are interested in teams and leagues and the demises of such and, and all that. But for me, you know, it started as. Not too dissimilarly, uh, you, you know, sort of pre and, and into adolescence. And for me, it was uh, through, uh, you know, OK play as a, as a, a soccer player, which was a still in, in northern New Jersey, kind of a, a privilege versus sort of where youth soccer is today. And this, you know, this uh, white hot comet known as the New York Cosmos, which was sort of an all star studded 
uh, soccer thing, which, you know, only in retrospect did I sort of recognize that it was truly once in a lifetime with some of the world's best players and and all that kind of stuff. And it was a phenomenon in the New York area. But that that I think there's something, I guess, around being and I I can only speak from experience because I've only been you know, a, a male all of my life, right? But but somebody, you know, a, a, a you know quintessentially sort of red-blooded American uh, boy, right? In particular, not exclusively, tends to be interested, uh, at least uh, in in years past, in sports. And sports tends to be one of those things that young boys, a lot of them, tend to identify with. And and it sounds like this was sort of the right timing uh, and the right sort of ex- uh, for some sort of, I guess psychological, emotional, and otherwise attachment. Oh, yeah, it really was, Tim. Um, quick aside, I'll never forget the um, when the Cosmos came to RFK to play the Washington Diplomats, <laughs> Pele and Beckenbauer. That was amazing, that, that game, because um, I got into soccer a little bit later. But what happened here was, you know, as a new kid, your little kid in a new neighborhood, it turned out there are all kinds of boys my age, and we all love sports. We play in our backyards. You know, we'd play board games. We played every sport you can imagine, and there were about fifteen of us. Um, you know, in you know, in between uh, marauding and causing trouble in the neighborhood, which of course the moms always knew. Back then, they had their network going; they were all home. <laughs> but yeah, I just fell in love with the sport. And an older boy up the street who was a fabulous athlete, uh, he was really into the um, Senators and and uh, and the football team, you know, the Skins, and he just kind of helped get us all hooked on that. And so sports is a big part of my life, you know, ever since I was seven in that neighborhood, uh, it was a little bit like the Sandlot kids, you know, um, we talked about it constantly. And then when you got to go to a game and you see these larger than life people, you know, down on the field and a giant like Frank Howard, um, you know, you, you definitely get, get addicted to it and you get hooked on it and, and you fall in love with it. And you never lose that that first love for baseball. I remember um, the the dad um, across the street told us that Frank Howard could hit home runs so far they'd go into the Anacostia River, it's like a mile behind the stadium. But you know, we were little kids, so we believed every word of it. So yeah, that's how you know. And then just you know, you don't lose that love, um, that longing. The team back in DC never went away. All right, so so to the best of your recollection, walk me into literally with you as you're going into uh, this multi-purpose stadium known as RFK Stadium. I, I guess it was RFK by that time, right? In '69, or was in, yes, yeah. Yes. So '69, it was changed, mm-hmm. right? And it was, I guess, it was called what was it called? DC Stadium prior than that. That's correct, right? Mm-hmm. So, what was your you're walking in? What what was your sort of initial sense of all of it? Because I, I remember my first uh, big uh, league baseball game at Yankee, the old, uh, just re- rebuilt Yankee Stadium and my first sort of Cosmos soccer game and stuff, you know, uh, uh, vividly with uh, colors, like green and green in particular because of the field. But what was it like, you know, wh- what was your experience as you walked in? Why were you, did it immediately overtake you or was it just more of a curiosity or did you know what to expect? The setup was like, um, almost like Christmas morning. You come into the parking lot, you walk under, um, pedestrian tunnel and then you get into this giant stadium you can imagine for a little kid it's just it's just this gigantic and and it looked beautiful from the outside with the cantilever decks and things you know sometimes it's denigrated as a concrete bowl but it really was a little bit different um and as you're walking you're going on all these switchback ramps and every once in a while there's a little opening you know we always sat up in the upper seats because my dad didn't have a bunch of money you know where the seats were cheaper but as you go through the lower seats, you get these little glimpses. It's like almost like when your parents bring the, the presents in and you kind of catch a glimpse, but you don't really see them of the field, a little hint of green. Maybe you see a player going by. And this just keeps kind of teasing you as you go further and further up. And it takes a while to walk in. And then you walk through that portal and it's like magic. You come out and there's this giant green field. Um, with those, you know, brilliant red uniforms the Senators wore just displayed out in front of you. So that sense of anticipation just builds and builds and builds. And then when you go back and, you know, when you go through and get to see it, it's like, wow, this is even better than I thought. So it, it just grabs you right away. And I remember when the, um, Nationals played the first game there, I took my um, oldest son and the same feeling hit me. It was like being a little kid all over again because the exact same experience happened. Then you walk out, and of course, that day the 
stadium was jam packed. Most of the time when you went to a senator's game, if it was half filled, it was a, a good crowd, you know, back then. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, it just overwhelms you and it's, it's beautiful. Um, I don't think there's any more beautiful sight in sports than a baseball diamond. That's, that's green and rich. And, and, and then you just have this sense of anticipation of what you're going to see that night too. Give me a sense of, as you're enjoying games as a kid and, and as you sort of look back now as an adult, uh, both in the work in the book and, and what's sort of come in the wake of it, you know, can you sort of put it in context? As I can imagine as a 10, 11 year old kid, uh, you're not aware that this is the second version of the Washington Senators. You're not uh, necessarily cognizant of uh, the team that was there before, why they left, uh, why this new team was sort of somewhat hastily brought into the mix, why they why the second team left, I, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I guess maybe to help our audience a bit, sort of maybe put this version two of the Washington Senators sort of in context in, in the American League, where I guess you would say that the Senators, both previous generally as well as current, the second version, were not necessarily known for their prowess on the diamond. <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah, I mean, of course, when you're a kid, you have no idea. They're just your childhood heroes. And and I had to actually overcome that that kind of hero worship when I did the interviews because now you know we're we're both adults we're both men I needed to talk to them man to man that took a, a little bit of getting used to, but yeah the, I mean the the original franchise started off poorly um, but they had a couple good years every now and then way 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 back in the pre integration baseball 1912 they kind of burst on the scene um, they had of course Walter Johnson was always a draw and then in the um, you know early 20s to like you know 24 they were world champions into 33 you know 24 25 and 33 they won the al pennant um you know won won the world series once uh, but then they sort of fell on on hard times um they didn't ever really have a lot of money and the other thing is clark griffith was quite an innovator but he was kind of a, a mom and pop shop baseball team and then the really ironic thing is of course, they couldn't scout. There was no draft. They could never keep up with the Yankees. You know, nobody really could in the American League. But they had Joe Cambria, who was really a groundbreaker in getting Cuban players. Now, of course, he had to, you know, make sure they had light skin and make up backstories that they, you know, they didn't have any uh, any African blood, you know, with all the prejudice back then. But, but on the other side of it, for some reason, even after um, – baseball integrated they were really reluctant to add um, black players they never really had more than one or two on the team and and you know of course the football team had the same the same issue and you know dc it for for some reason which i think is really pertinent with what you're seeing today was seen as a southern town um with really really strict racial divides even though it also had a, an amazing you know, black component, Howard University, you know, a real strong middle class, but they just never came together. I mean, the Grays were the Negro League baseball team that played there. There was some talk of recruiting, but it never happened. And and that really, I think, hindered the Senators. It was a, a real contributing factor to their terrible records. Yeah, I mean, 1945, they won 87 games, and they didn't come close to that again until 69. And so that's a long time to have a bad team. So I think low budget operation, um, not a big stadium, that racial prejudice, in some ways they were tying their own hands um, and they just weren't ever very good. And of course, that first iteration left. I mean, again, it's amazing how history comes back, uh, comes back around. Calvin Griffith you know, just had his uh, his bust or his statue removed from uh, from the twin stadium and, and he was quite open. The reason he moved the senators after he took over, um, he was an adopted child of Clark was he wanted, he wanted to go to a place where there weren't as many black people. It was just very, very sad. Um, and the team was just starting to get good too. You know, they, they had Killebrew, they had drafted crew, Jim Cott. I mean, five years later, they're in the world series. Um, the second iteration was, they were hastily assembled, um, partly because uh, Congress said, look, if you take a team out of D.C., you can say goodbye to your antitrust exemption. And so they scrambled. And, of course, they had to add that second team 
the uh, LA Angels, California Angels. But I mean, they just were terrible. You know, the, the expansion draft was just dregs. It wasn't like you had today where they try to um, help them get started. Um, the senators didn't really invest in the farm system. So, yeah, they really, really struggled the second iteration. Um, and a lot of people didn't really adopt them. They were a little bit resentful that the American League dropped this terrible team, again, with pretty cash-strapped owners onto them. Um, and then here comes Bob Short in 69, um, outbids Bob Hope. Um, with a hev- heavily leveraged $9 million. It's funny, $9 million bought a baseball team back then. Uh, hard to imagine now when they're worth billions. But he buys the team. Um, and he knows that the lease with the D.C. Stadium Authority expires on September 30th, 1971. So I think from the get-go, uh, Mr. Short, who's kind of the Dr. Evil of the story here in D.C. baseball, um, was – making overtures to other places and especially Texas. I think right from the start, um, he also did things like raise ticket prices very high, um, change the stadium. If you look at pictures, you'll see a lot of people in the upper deck and barely anybody in the lower. Like what is going on there? Well, upper was the only general admission and the ushers were really, really strict about not letting you down there. I can tell you because we tried, my dad and I tried to sneak down and it just wasn't happening. So, um, it was quite sad. They never really had good, strong ownership after uh, Clark Griffith passed away. Um, and you hear a lot about they didn't support the team, but they never really had a team worth supporting, uh, you know, if you think about it. So I think the fans get a bad rap sometimes. I think there were other reasons the teams left that really weren't the fans' fault. Uh, so 69 was like the one shining season that gave people hope for the future in the midst of a lot of badness. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's the, the, the short story is pretty interesting because, you know, this is the guy who kind of, you know, uh, was responsible for the Lakers going from Minneapolis to Los Angeles before selling them to Jack and Cook and, and, and then sort of the, uh, the, the ongoing giganticism, I guess, of that franchise uh, in the years to come. And then, uh, you know, I, it seems like that sort of uh, uh, battle, I guess, for this expansion franchise uh, uh, with Bob Hope seems interesting, but it seems like now, I guess, in, in retrospect, you know, this is kind of something that maybe Short kind of had sort of experienced before, the idea of understanding the value of a franchise and relocation and the valuations of such. And, you know, the the beginnings, if you will, of the big money sort of, uh, uh, you know, and frankly, if he's borrowing heavily to, to purchase this franchise, it, it would seem, I guess, sort of in retrospect, av- have, after uh, coming into this franchise, that he was probably, to your point, already looking about where and how to maximize value for this. Uh, and it sounds like the rumblings of maybe in another location other than D.C. were, were well underway by 69 when you became uh, you know, interested in the team. Oh, absolutely. I mean, at the end of spring training in 69, you've got an exhausted club. I mean, they played a lot of games back then and spring training dragged on forever. They had about a week off at the beginning because that was the first baseball strike. Interesting. Marvin Miller had just taken over with the uh, Players Association. And what they got was shorter pensions, which will come into play later for a lot of the guys on this team that helped them. But um, just as an aside, but it was a long spring training. They're exhausted. And Short books two exhibition games at Turnpike Stadium in Texas, moves them from New Orleans, where the, the field is declared unplayable. Um, by his groundskeeper, which was kind of shady. And so um, they play in this dusty, horrible uh, stadium, two games, only 9,000 people show up. But that's when I think the conversations, if they hadn't started earlier, where they really, really got going between Tom Vandergriff, who was really instrumental in getting a team to Texas. He was really passionate about that. And Bob Short. And you're right. Short was in some ways ahead of his time. And understanding if you if you take on debt to buy a franchise, if you can move it to a city that's desperate for a team, you make your debt back and then some with the sale. So he was able to raise capital for his trucking firm um, that way for both the Lakers and and uh, moving the senators. And, and he didn't particularly care about the. Um, you know, the sad fans he left in his wake. He was well connected. He was chairman for a while, the Democratic National Committee. Uh, he went to Georgetown Law. So he did have some connections to D.C. 
his home was Minnesota, ironically enough. Um, but he's very persuasive too. And you'll see that, you know, later in this, this story. Um, but, you know, people didn't think Congress would let him move the team and, and the, in the DC fans and the government were kind of apathetic that it's not going to happen. And they really underestimated his persuasive powers. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that's an interesting part of the story, uh, of this, this 69 season short was really good at getting people to do what he wanted. He wanted them to do. Well, let, let's put 69 in context because in the arc of this uh, second version of the senators, right, this is sort of the, this is the latter years, right? Not necessarily be known to the fans at the time and even some of the players and all that kind of stuff, or maybe, you know, through uh, reading of the tea leaves, maybe people had gotten some inklings, but 1968 was not very kind to this team. This is, uh, you know, essentially the worst attended team uh, that year in 68. Uh, and they had uh, finished in the basement of the American League, not just their division, uh, which was, you know, fairly common for them not to be nearly <laughs> even closely competitive. So but what happens? Right. So there's obviously Mr. Short has some a couple of things up his sleeve in particular, the hiring of a certain gentleman that kind of uh, maybe is a sort of a shot in the arm and, and maybe emblematic of how 69 was maybe going to sort of play out. Yeah, it was uh, 68. Uh, Hank Allen, one of the guys on the team who I interviewed, he said that, that was a season of disaster. I mean, it just, you know, bizarre scenes. Eddie Brinkman, shortstop, spent more time there guarding the stadium for the National Guard, you know, with the with all the, uh, the rioting after uh, Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy were assassinated than he did actually playing baseball. So, yeah, it's a really more fun franchise, and a lot of people had lost hope by then. So, Short and, and and the football team too. They were terrible. You know, other than Sonny Jurgensen in the offense, there was not much to watch. But yeah, Short buys the team, and then oh, about a couple weeks after that's announced, it gets announced that Edward Bennett Williams um, for Washington has signed Vince Lombardi. So Short's like, oh boy, you know, this team already had more press than me, and now they've got the best football coach in history coming. I got to do something. And so it was a couple of people he had man that he had interviewed for manager. You know, Nellie Fox was one of them. They it, short like people with pizzazz. You know, he called himself a, a swinger in the slang at the time kind of, that Austin Powers picked up later. Um, so he says, you know what, I'm, I'm going after Ted Williams. I'm like, you are nuts. Ted Williams is not he's not going to manage. He doesn't even want to manage the Boston Red Sox. The Yankees tried for years. Why would he manage the worst team in baseball? You know, that, that with the worst attendance, everything. They were the worst in everything. And Short, just, he goes after him. He, he tracks him down, gets his phone number in the Florida Keys, um, arranges to meet with him in Atlanta, flies his private jet, gives Williams, you know, who, remember, was a pilot in, in World War II and Korean War, a really <laughs> darn good one, too, um, gives him a tour of the, of the plane, you know, lets him check it out. Um, and so they start building a rapport. Short was a great, great salesman. Um, they meet in Atlanta, don't tell the press. Um, and they have these, you know, secret negotiations and short offers him a really good salary and 5% uh, stake in the team. So, you know, for Williams financially, um, it's a really good deal. And I think he and him and short hit it off in some ways. And, and I also think Williams liked the challenge. Of um, of taking this bad ball club that had some potential to uh, make them better. So lo and behold, a couple weeks after Lombardi's signed, they announced Williams signing. And it took them a while to work out the legal details. Um, in the book, you, you know, I go into that some how the deal almost fell through. But now all of a sudden, DC's got Lombardi and Ted Williams. I mean, they're on the map now. They're not a backwater anymore. You know, and Ted Williams, I mean, he's electric. That's what Frank, Frank Howard says. He, he, he's, he says he, when he walks into a room, you know, he owns that room immediately. I mean, they, and the players are just in awe. They have the, the greatest hitter of all time um, now is their manager. Um, now, this is halfway into spring training. So he's only, he's only got like a month to get his team ready. Um, and learn about them. But boy, it just took DC by storm. And, and you know what it did? It gave people hope and it, it gave people something to talk about other than how terrible the team was. So there was a lot of buzz in my neighborhood with my friends, with, with, with the, gosh, the dads were really, really into it. And, um, 
Well, so I, I get the Redskins and, and the uh, Lombardi thing, right? And 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 trying yeah. to sort of break yeah. through on the on the Washington sports scene. Why Williams in particular? Because this guy had not had any. I mean, obviously a legendary career. I think he was even inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, around this time, but he had no managerial uh, background. So I guess the why why him, especially given the thin to non-existent managerial background. I think Short wanted the pizzazz of a celebrity manager. Um, and, and he was willing to take the risk of no managerial background. Um, he had Williams had helped in spring training, so he, coaching, you know, hitting. But I think Short just, you know, to use the the hearts, just went for shooting the moon. I think he just said, "Hey, I need someone that's going to put this team on the map." Um, and I don't know if he can manage or not, but I'm going to I'm going to take a risk. Um, he certainly knows a lot about hitting more than anybody else on earth. So I'm, I'm going to just uh, just hope that this guy will um, take his celebrity status um, and transfer it to success on the on the field. Kind of like it, it can't get any worse because it certainly hadn't been any worse than it was 68, I guess. Right. Exactly. And, and you know, everyone thought I think Short also liked proving people wrong. You know, everybody thought he was on a fool's errand and wasting time. You know, the season's coming. Stop. You know, you're, why are you chasing this guy? You know, we've got to get a manager and get to work. He, he liked proving people wrong. And of course, two years later, he, he did it again. So I think it was the challenge and, and wanting the notoriety for the team. Um, and uh, he kind of got lucky. Turned out that Williams was a pretty darn good manager, at least that first year. Well, let, let's talk about that year because uh, he wound up to be chosen uh, manager, I guess, manager of the year. I guess that was the sort of the... Uh, uh, I, I, let's put it, nobody had any expectations for this team, even after Ted Williams, I think, had been, I mean, maybe aside from the diehard fans, right? But And hope was certainly there. But, you know, uh, when it came to projections and the on-field talent, and you were mentioning sort of a, a, a poor, you know, all those things, it just, and the year prior, uh, it just seemed like that nobody was expecting anything from this team yet again. That's true, Tim. I mean, they, they didn't add any any player of note it was pretty much the same roster as 68 so yeah, there was really no hope and then when they split the divisions they get put they get put in with the teams that finished in the top five the year before you know in the american league east so you got the defending champion tigers red Sox of 67 orioles of 66 you have you know three defending champions indians who had had a had a good year you know um and and then the yankees who were kind of falling on hard times but they had you know, the legend so everyone thought man these <laughs> they're they got to play 90 games against these teams. They're dead. I mean, they don't have anything except Howard. But what Williams did was he brought out the best in this team. And a lot of people focused on the hitting. And that's it's definitely true. I mean, if you look at Frank Howard's statistics before 69, you'll see an undisciplined slugger that struck out a lot, struggled to get on base. Well, when Williams got a hold of him and said, you know, look, Frank, I need you to take a strike. I need you to be more patient at, at the plate because – how can you have 44 home runs and only 54 walks? And Williams was ahead of his time, and he understood the value of getting on base, the value of a walk. And that was something that I don't think anybody realized, even short. But Williams had that even back when, when he played. And he did the same thing with Mike Epstein. Both Howard and Epstein got on base more than 40% of the time, not to get too wonky with stats, but they had never come close to that before um he got ed brinkman to hit better he got del unser to hit for a little bit of power just on and on and on but the other thing that people don't realize is the senator's pitching staff in 69 had a lower era than they did in 68 the year of the pitcher so when you look at league average their pitching improvement was about the same or better than their hitting improvement i mean dick bosman era champion Casey Cox said, the thing that Ted taught me was to think how hitters think. I'd never done that before. He says, you know, he took 180 degrees and said, Casey, you've got to think about what the hitter's thinking up there. And he said it transformed him as a pitcher. He had an ERA under three that year. Dave Baldwin, side-arming right-hander, same thing. Um, you know, he said, Ted would talk to us about the approach, what was going through a hitter's mind, how you set them up. So he helped the hitters and the pitchers. Um, and I, I think people underestimated how much he had thought about the game. Um, the only piece he didn't know was the fielding and the strategy, but he had two guys who were great at it. He had Nellie Fox, one of the best in the game at that, that part of baseball, the inside baseball. 
and he had Wayne Twilliger, uh, Twiggy, his third base coach, two infielders, and they knew that part of the game backwards and forwards. So he he let them run with that, you know, stolen bases, hit and run, and he focused on what he knew best. So he was also a good leader in getting the best out of his troops. The last part is he threw prejudice out the window. Phil Wood tells a story, one of the um, coaches from the 68 team, he made a racist remark the first week in spring training. William said, you're out of here. You're fired. I want this guy gone. He was gone. And Hank Allen said, Ted Williams gave us an equal opportunity that we didn't have before. Now, not every player on the team agrees with Hank Allen on that, but that was Hank Allen's perception as a black player. He said, Williams just got rid of that. You, you played based on merit. So he changed the culture. He changed the thinking and he got the best out of, out of his other coaches. And, you know, lo and behold, this team now that was wretched is playing 500 baseball into August. It, it, yeah, it was no one had that expectation at all. I mean, it was a thrill for the fans and, and the, the baseball establishment was just, you know, they were shocked. They, they, they came out of nowhere. Okay, what's this? Ah, yes, the new book by Diane Shaw. I am happy and ecstatic to recommend it. It's called A Farewell to Arms, Legs, and Jockstraps. Who is Diane Shaw, you may ask, and what's it about? Well, Diane Shaw is a uh, a writer of mystery novels and biographies and other, other great works. But before that, uh, you may have known her in the 1960s and 1970s as the pioneering female sports journalist that kind of broke through the barriers, the glass ceilings, if you will. Uh, becoming really the first uh, major national newspaper sports columnist who happened to be female at the uh, Los Angeles Herald Examiner, for, uh, for that matter. And uh, it, her book uh, is just it's just chock full of great anecdotes. It's a memoir of all of her trials and travails, shall we say, uh, in trying to cover sports in this country as a woman. You know, back in the 60s and 70s, you young whippersnappers, you have no idea how challenging it was. And there's a whole generation and then some of female sports reporters and columnists and writers and, and on-air personalities who can uh, owe their careers uh, to the doors that uh, she uh, just uh, plowed through uh, back uh, back in the day. And uh, some great stories and some great uh, anecdotes. And, and one that we especially love uh, features a certain United States president uh, and uh, some interesting times when he was uh, running a team and then trying to bulldoze his way through uh, the old USFL, the New Jersey Generals in particular. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the story here. It's well worth <laughs> the price of admission in this book alone. And uh, we uh, highly encourage you uh, to check it out wherever fine books are found. It's called A Farewell to Arms, Legs and Jockstraps. It is published by the Indiana University Press and their imprint, Red Lightning Books. And we thank both of them uh, for uh, offering our listeners a, an exclusive free chapter download uh, right now. You just, all you have to do is visit this little uh, website and I'll repeat it again, cause it's a little clunky. Uh, and you're gonna get a free special uh, sneak peek, free chapter of the book, A Farewell to Arms, Legs and Jockstraps. Just go to this website, iupress.org slash jockstraps dash good seats. That's iupress.org. It's I, the letter I, the letter U, press, iupress.org, slash jockstraps, one word, dash good seats, one word. And again, you're going to get a free special sneak peek, a free chapter download of the brand new book by Diane Shaw, A Farewell to Arms, Legs, and Jockstraps. Uh, if you don't remember that uh, URL, we'll have a link to it on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, off of this episode, and um, you will enjoy this book. I guarantee it, and I appreciate the friends, our friends, our new friends at Red Lightning Books and Indiana, Indiana University Press, hard to say, uh, for their sponsorship and uh, bringing our attention uh, to this great book by Dan Diane Shaw. He says, A Farewell to Arms, Legs, and Jockstraps. Uh, I know you'll enjoy the free sample, and I know you'll enjoy the book. Try it out, and uh, as they say, you'll be glad you did. All right, back to our uh, conversation. Here it comes. What was the what was the um, uh, the buzz uh, fan wise and, and media wise uh, during the course of this year as it's playing out? Because on the field, I think a lot of people sort of uh, look back and and 
the sort of the casual baseball observer would sort of say, okay, there's the Baltimore Orioles who are tearing it up, uh, in, in, you know, basically adjacent to the Washington, D.C. market, which is always a, a source of consternation, which we've seen over the years in, in various <laughs> things, as well as, frankly, those amazing Mets, right? As Having grown up in the New York area, I was way too little at that time to sort of uh, be conscious of it. But obviously, the lore, of course, is that, you know, uh, that sort of uh, battle that they had, you know, with the Cubs and coming back and, and winning it all, I think a lot of people kind of uh, uh, lose sight of the fact that the senators were really becoming uh, a story, if not for maybe those bigger narratives that, you know, over time, historians pretty much have lap- latched on to for 69. Yeah, I'd, I mean, after the beginning of the season, nationally, you know, the, the, the focus was on Williams and, and that kind of that kind of uh, euphoria and attention, it's faded some. I mean, the sporting news, you know, was big then and they and they they'd have you know some prominent articles. But the buzz nationally did fade, you know, in the shadow of the Mets and the Cubs and the Orioles, of course, were you know one of the best teams in baseball history that year. Um, but locally, the buzz continued. I mean, back then, the Baltimore and Washington were not as close together culturally or in any way. I mean. We, it was unheard of for us to go to Baltimore back then, and, and, and we we never met anybody, kids from Maryland. So um, you had that kind of distance culturally then that you don't have now, um, and, the, and the areas were much smaller. But locally, the team loved it. Like Del Unser tells the story. They came back from a road trip where they had, had done better than expected against Boston, uh, Detroit, and Cleveland, won six out of nine. And they went to see Damn Yankees at Burnbray, now defunct Burnbray Dinner Theater. Um, I lived just up the road from there years ago, and they were playing Damn Yankees, uh, which is great, you know, <laughs> perfect timing. And at intermission, the uh, the house manager came out and said, "Hey, we have some real senators in the audience tonight," and introduced them. And he said the crowd gave him a standing ovation or a prolonged standing ovation. And he said, "You know, I'll never forget that." And then Dick Bosman tells the story. They came back um, from that same road trip and there were like 1,500, 2,000 people waiting for them when they uh, departed from Friendship Airport, which is now BWI, just cheering, holding signs. You know, one, one old lady said, this is the first time I've had hope in the team since the days of Walter Johnson and, and, uh, and Joe Cronin. So, yeah, there was a lot, a lot of local buzz and it, it continued all through the year. Um, because they, you know, they stayed right around 500. The all-star game was there that year. So that added some national buzz. It was the uh, centennial of baseball, professional baseball. So they had the best players of all time. So you had this star studded gala, you know, around the game, um, at RFK, Frank Howard hit a home run in that game. And then at the end of the year, um, when they won their last game, the crowd, which was, it was a pretty large crowd, about 30,000 that, that night, that day. They gave them a standing ovation um, just as a thank you for giving, you know, giving them an unexpectedly great season. And I think it sustained some hope for BC baseball even after they left. So that's why 69 is a really special year for me and I think for anybody that loves uh, Washington baseball. Well, I, you know, I wonder, too, I'm Mr. Cynical here, uh, the, you know, the American League in 69 had expand was exp- uh, did expand right to Kansas City and Seattle. Right. So right there, you've got a bunch of games that are uh, even uh, I guess even in the sort of veteran status of the uh, second version of the Senators were kind of basically arguably easy wins. So I, how much of that was sort of it in the mixture as well? Or was this truly Arguably, you've got two brand new teams that are relatively going to be easy uh, targets, I guess. Right. Uh, did that enter into the equation or was this truly a transformation as well or maybe more so than than just the uh, thinning of the uh, the combatants? I think the thinning of the combatants helped the whole league in general. Uh, and then the rule changes to lower the mound and change the strike zone. So there was more offense. But the senators, they didn't benefit from playing the expansion teams. Um they, they really struggled against them. I mean, they had a game in Seattle um, early in their early in the season, and I think they were winning eleven to three after the fourth inning, uh, and they ended up losing that game sixteen to fifteen. And, and Williams said that game makes me so mad I want to scream, you know, because they and they're blaming his sixth stadium was was a really a minor league stadium posing as a major league, making excuses, but they they struggled. And then later in that same series, Mike Marshall. 
you know, later would be famous for the, the 74 Dodgers as a you know, relief Iron Man. He shot them out like on a two hitter. They couldn't beat these guys. They went 10 and 14 against the pilots and the Royals. Um, you know, they just, for, for whatever reason, they were two pretty bad teams, but they couldn't beat them. Um, the teams they did, did feast on were um, the Chicago White Sox, beat them eight out of 12. The, the Red Sox, which, you know, made Williams, he always had extra motivation playing them. They beat them 12 out of 18. And then their real patsies were the uh, Cleveland Indians. They went 15 and three against them. So if you break down their record, they actually were two games under 500 against the rest of the league. Um, but, but they really, um, really feasted on Cleveland. And Cleveland had a terrible year that year. Just everything went wrong for them. The, the team that always pounded them was the Orioles. I mean, 13 and five actually wasn't a bad showing uh, against, against them. You know, they, they regularly beat up on most of the American League, but the Senators in particular. But, yeah, the expansion didn't help them other than maybe thinning the talent out for the other teams. So it, it was a really strange way that they got to their 86 wins. Um, they didn't feast on the, those two particular bad teams at all. Well, put, put this in context. I mean, the Orioles won 109 games that season. Oh, I mean, it's just, and, 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 they you know, the Senators actually finished fourth this year, right? Uh, mm-hmm. 23 games back and uh, with the Tigers and, and the Red Sox slightly ahead of them. But that said, it absolutely was, uh, 69 was a a turning point. I mean, D.C. is becoming more of a sports town, it seems, seemingly overnight. You know, Williams and, and crew, uh, the, the attendance certainly rebounded pretty pretty nicely in the All-Star game. I mean, all those things, the spotlight certainly seemed to be be there. How? So I guess, I guess put this in context, right? So again, a more jaded sort of cynical comment, but... How does the manager, a brand new manager at that, of a fourth place AL East team, and by the way, 69 was the first season where the uh, where MLB uh, split uh, the leagues into two divisions uh, for the first time. How does a fourth place, if you will, runner up, if you will, in the AL East become manager of the year? I mean, it, it seems to me like it was 68 was just so damn bad that uh, this was just uh, nobody expected anything. And just the fact that they were competitive and decently clear of 500 uh, was, quote unquote, good enough. I mean, wh- why not the Mets? Why not the Orioles and their managerial talents, for example? Yeah, that you would think. Um, you know, the, the Senators, they did improve by 23 games and only the Mets did better. The, the interesting thing back then, Tim, with the Orioles, they were so good and they ran away with the division so quickly. I think people didn't give... Earl Weaver enough credit. They called him back then a push button manager because he had his four starters that were fabulous. Mostly would pitch complete games. He had his top lineup. Um, and, and they just, they, they kind of discounted it because like, well, you know, anybody could manage that team and, and, and up at 109 wins. They just overlooked that to go to Williams, but the senator's success was so unexpected because they had been so bad, uh, particularly the year before, that I think, um, and I think also Williams, um, I think the charisma and, and the celebrity didn't hurt either. I mean, that, you know, he, he was a, an American legend by that point, not just a baseball legend. So I think the combination of how unlikely the Senator's success was, um, Williams' celebrity status, and how the Orioles just, you know, made the division a cakewalk. You add that all up, and, and Williams, I think, got more attention probably than he deserved, although it was an amazing job that he did. I, mean, I don't know if anybody else could have done it. And I think um, Earl Weaver and Gil Hodges um, didn't get as much credit as they deserve um, for, you know, f- for how well they managed their teams, getting them to the World Series. So Williams' celebrity status helped him this time, I think, in the past because he was so prickly with the writers. And of course, that didn't change, by the way in 69. Um, but I think he was more a celebrity when he played, I think it, you know, kind of helped him, uh, to get that honor. And of course for DC, it was great. I mean, you know, we never got any coaching honors. And I think, you know, Lombardi also had a winning season that year too. So I think it's the first time the two teams had a winning season since sometime in the forties. So yeah, you're right. They, there was some hope finally for DC sports. Well, so what what about the press? What about Williams? What about Short? And and I guess maybe if you can kind of sort of cul-de-sac around, when does the press start to get wind 
of the machinations, shall we say, of of maybe not staying around town too much longer. Mm, okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, media wise, <laughs> Ted Williams comes in, um, and after his first press conference, where he was pretty subdued when they announced his signing, he gets his spring training and he said, "Okay, writers." We're having a 15 minute cooling off period before you're allowed to come in the locker room. And they, of course, that went over like a lead balloon and they petitioned the commissioner and, and Ted Williams said, this is the rule. And even <laughs> forgive me, he, this is quoting him. <laughs> he said, even Jesus Christ himself can't change it. And by gosh, he made that rule stick all year long. And the writers absolutely hated it. Well, but, and, um, and why, though? Is that because Williams was was kind of a player's manager or at least coming in as such because he hadn't managed? He was a player and that was his sort of mindset or was it a distaste th- for the press and he just kind of manufactured a reason for that? I think it was a distaste for the press because I think in his playing days, uh, he probably said things that he wished he hadn't said because they, they were you know bursting into the locker room right after the game in the heat of the moment. So he wanted to protect his players from that and himself. Um, I think so. Of course, the, the, the media didn't want that. The, the writers didn't want that because that's the good stuff. Once everyone calms down, you know, they're going to do the, the nuclear loose thing. Well, you know, I just want to help the team play a good game. You know, other people, you know, you know the kind of if you watch Anthony Rendon do an interview today, it's kind of that the, the cliches. And, and so that makes for boring copy. So, um I think that's that's why. Now, as to the machinations, um, it was really early on. Um, William, William Gadea, uh, who just passed away, great writer, longtime legendary Washington Post uh, sports guy. Yeah. Yes. Um, just you know, a legend. He sniffed out when those first games were in Texas that there were some machinations going on. Now it kind of got lost in the euphoria of how well the team was playing. Um, it, but then when the season rolled around to 70 and they go back and play these exhibition games there, he starts to kind of be like a bloodhound on this story. And so by 70, the the press, Gildea, uh, Shirley Povich, who was still writing back then, they're, they're on to this. Um, they're, they're not surprised. And they know that Short has these, uh, these machinations in the works. Um, and there was a lot of resentment. Um, in the D.C. area. And I think that also contributed to some of the drop in attendance um, in 70 and 71. But it also was because the team didn't have nearly the success they had in in 69. And that's why I think in the last game in 71, where you have the forfeit and there's basically a riot breaks out on the field and fans storm the field, there was so much anger because, you know, everybody except nine-year-old boys like me, you know, knew this was this was a fait accompli. And they were really, really angry about it um, to the fact that when, <laughs> you know, the sh- short stinks banner in 69, when they closed RFK in 2007, some of my D.C. baseball history friends unfurled a banner <laughs> that said short still stinks. <laughs> and it was up for about about 30 seconds till the uh, Nationals um, uh, ushers came and took it down, but enough for it, for people to get pictures of it um, who were clued off ahead of time. So the resentment still it still hasn't died off. I got emails from people who read my book just excoriating short how much that, I mean, for me myself and like you know what it's time to let it go. Um, we have a new team now. You know, all is forgiven. We're world champions, or the Nationals are world champions. Um, but um, like I say, he's really the villain in in, in this piece because all behind the scenes he's removing you know in in the works to remove baseball from dc and boy it was gone for a long long time so um but yeah the press was on to him by 1970 well all right going back to your childhood days okay so you've experienced 1969 and and all the wonderment and 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 arguably as you you know reflect back right that was it was a it was a a turning point, if you will, in that short uh, sort of life of that second version of the franchise. But what was your what were your memories, if you can recall, about what uh, 1970 was portending? Right. Not knowing knowing some or all of this sort of the behind the scenes stuff going on. Um, were you sort of uh, hooked, if you will? And, and were you sort of and frankly, generally, were people sort of expecting 70 to be sort of a continuation and a move upward? 
uh, was there indeed hope? Was it lingering into 70 aside from the, maybe the distractions? Oh, there certainly was. I mean, we were, me and my friends were really fired up and we thought, you know, get a couple better players and then and, and you're into the 90 wins and you're into the pennant race. So there was a lot of hope and the expectations were entirely different in 70. Um, and then we were really excited when they traded um, early in the year, they traded Ken McMullen um, to get uh, Aurelio Rodriguez to play third base. Um, McMullen went to the Angels. Rodriguez came in uh, to, for the Senators um, and they picked up Rick Reichart too. So it looked like they were improving the team but the problem is um, as i found out later when i worked on the book um, ken mcmullen was a clubhouse glue kind of guy clubhouse leader and a darn good player very underrated player and i think uh, williams and short didn't appreciate um and i I think that's a shortcoming of williams as a manager that whole clubhouse vibe and how the interactions go you think he'd appreciate that as a player but when they traded ken mcmullen Kind of some of the heart and soul of the 69 team started to die. And they did okay in 70. Bosman had a good year. Howard had an even better year than he had in 69. I mean, he was just raking. Um, but they were, I think, eight games under 500 going into the last two weeks of the season. And, and not great, but they had a good run in 69. They won eight of their last nine. So, you know, put a good run together and you might finish 500, which was a disappointment in 70. would have been, but they... <laughs> This is what really, I think, killed baseball early in D.C. They lost their last 14 games, 14 in a row, to close the season. So whatever hope there was kind of got snuffed out um, then. So 70 really was the air out of the balloon. The expectations were high and the performance was low and the ending just left a bad taste in everybody's mouth. And then uh, Short blew up the team. After that, a lot of folks know about, you know, the infamous trade for Denny McLean and lots of other trades. Yeah, let, let, let's talk about that one that one quickly for a second, because, I you know, that mm-hmm. uh, it seems to me almost uh, 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 almost uh, symptomatic or, or emblematic, perhaps. But uh, there's also some intrigue with that. Right. So maybe you can explain that there was basically a bunch of uh, of quality players that went to Detroit in exchange for for Denny McLean, who at the time and, and since had some, uh, let's shall we say, off the field issues that were. Of, of, of significance, but there's also a, 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 a threat out there, and you tell me if it's true or not, that it wasn't just an exchange of players and maybe trying to keep the budget under control. It also seems like there was some uh, political uh, uh, connections when it, with regards to where this franchise was going to go eventually. Yeah, there is, Tim. There, there, there's, there's sort of a backstory that part of that trade, so you have Ed Brinkman, great fielding shortstop, Aurelio Rodriguez, Joe Coleman, who was blossoming into a great pitcher at that point, for uh, and Jim Hannon for Don, Don Wharton, Denny McLean. Uh, yeah, it was it wasn't a, a good trade. Although McLean had a decent year in '70, but almost everyone in baseball knew whose arm was shot. But the legend is that part of the deal was the Tigers' owner would vote yes when Short wanted to move the uh, team, and the final vote ended up being ten to two, and, and, and I think it had to be nine to three. So that helped put him over the top. I couldn't find anything in in my research to confirm that, but a lot of people say that that happened. Um, people like Phil Wood, who you know was the dean of DC baseball, so I'm inclined to believe that 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 was kind of a the shady machinations of the deal. And then McLean was uh, he was quite a, a rebel. He, he led clubhouse rebellions. Bernie Allen, who uh, was on the team in '69, good left hand hitting second baseman. He told me a great story about how he and he and Denny McLean went to play golf one morning and uh, Joe Camacho and George Susie coaches on the team. Their job was to tail these guys because Williams had a no golf rule, $10,000 fine, which is big money back then. If you were caught golfing, McLean's list, screw Williams for playing golf. So they, they leave the hotel, get in a cab, Susie and Camacho get in a cab and follow them. They go to a, this is in Kansas City. They go to a, a, a office building walk through the lobby, out the other end, get into another cab, <laughs> and go to a golf course. And he said the coaches were um, asking every golf course in the area if McLean and Allen were playing. And, of course, McLean gave, uh, gave the golf course owners some, some money and tickets to the game, um, and they played under assumed names, so they could never finger them. <laughs> so um, McLean started a 
clubhouse revolt called the Underminers to um, to basically just uh, push back on anything Williams wanted to do. So the, the 71 senators were about as dysfunctional a unit as you could ever imagine. And McLean was the ringleader, uh, most definitely. And he couldn't pitch anymore. I mean, his arm was shot. Um, and, you know, he just gave up a lot of home runs. And it, it was a disaster. Did you go to games in 71? Yes. Yeah, was it palpable? What, what, what did you like? When did you know? When did it finally come into your, I guess, what, 11, 10 year old consciousness that things were not going to continue? It didn't come into my consciousness because I was so naive till the day, the day before. Because you know, these guys are still my heroes, and I still believe they were gonna, you know, gonna be there forever. But and but then I knew, and I begged my dad to take me to the last game, and he just he says I'm not doing it because it's not going to be safe. Uh, and I cried, and, you know, threw a tantrum like a nine year old boy would do, and and uh, that's when I knew. And then of course, you know, the tears just flow when your team leaves. It's, um, you know, my heart breaks for even, you know, Montreal. It was great to have Washington get a team, but, you know, there's nine-year-old kids in Montreal that had that same experience that I did. And it's really, um, it, it, it doesn't go away, um, surprisingly enough. Um, you think that, that it would, but you, that, that kind of sports scar uh, on your memory remains. And that's when I knew, and it was it, at the time, you know, I was, again, fortunate enough not to have any other tragedy in my life. Um, that was devastating to me. So as you went back into this story then, and as you sort of, to your point earlier, uh, try to be a bit more, shall we say, objective and mature in your conversations with the various folks involved uh, that you had access to, uh, were you able to square, uh, I guess, those sort of childhood memories and perceptions with the realities and and it sounds like again you still have that sort of scar right but scar implies there at least is some healing so to speak right so i guess my question somewhere in there is do you kind of understand some of the dynamics better or do you still because of the raw and purity of your, rawness and purity of your uh, fandom at the time and, and your delicate age if you will that that it really kind of won't heal and or it is still stinging i'd say it it's healed. It's still hard for me to understand the justification short had for moving the team. Um, I think because I, I look at it in terms of, um, you know, Washington as a sports town. Um, I don't live too far from Baltimore and, and, and a, a lot of this denigration is kind of faded now, um, as DC has gotten more prominent with sports, but th there was, um, one of my son's little league coaches says, ah, oh, baseball is never going to work in DC. That's not a baseball town. You know, they lost two teams and, and that part, that scar is still there because I, I don't think that's justified. The part that I do understand is that short needed money and the, the way to get it was to move the team from his personal financial standpoint for himself and his business. I definitely understand that it was an offer too good to pass up. So it's kind of mixed feelings, I'd say. I mean, that year, you know, I can tell you we would go to games like second or third game of a series and. I'm like, Dad, why are this trash in the aisles? They would only clean the stadium at the end of each series, not the end of each game. The Senators had the highest ticket prices in the league with one of the worst teams. So I still have some resentment that Washington gets a bad rap when, you know, short like any owner, like like Bob Irsay did in Baltimore and probably Art Modell in Cleveland, you know, any owner when they want to move the team is going to do everything they can to suppress attendance. Um, so I, I really... I really push back on the narrative of, you know, any city losing a team because they quote unquote didn't support them. I think the, the owner has a responsibility to put a team on the field that's worthy of the support and to price their product in line with the quality. And that didn't happen in DC. And, and the players that you talked to, uh, what was their recollections of that season and around that time? I mean, with, were, were they kind of in on it or were they just kind of like just hired guns? I mean, did they sort of have, belief and, and camaraderie and they lost it or I mean I, how, what were their feelings about it or do they kind of know that they were like Short's uh, last name implies that uh, it wasn't going to be sort of for the shall we say longer term the 69 team I don't think had a lot of cognizance that they were that Short was you know fixing to move them two years later a lot of the guys I talked to say that's one of their most treasured years in baseball that includes people like Del Unser who was a World Series champion and played a big role later in 1980 for the Phillies and Del, um, and Daryl Knowles 
who pitched in every game of the 1973 World Series, including getting the final out. Uh, they they treasure 1969. Dick Bosman treasures that year. He threw a no hitter later in Cleveland, uh, but 69 is his favorite season. Wayne Twilliger uh, said, "You know, I was out drinking a beer with Nellie Fox and hanging out with Ted Williams, and you you couldn't ask for more." Frank Howard, of course, loves DC. I mean, I think it broke his heart to leave. So they had a lot of camaraderie, a lot of love for the city in 69. But by 71, they all could see the writing on the wall, and you know they. It's their job. I mean, they they had to go along with it. You know, back then the players didn't have much power anyway. Um, you know, later they did. But th- they kind of were resigned to it and that they were going to do the job the best they could um, in Texas as they did in D.C., even though some of them, like Frank Howard, were heartbroken. Um, and, uh, but he was probably the most. I remember Dick Bosman. He said it was sad to leave, but, you know, I – I was in the prime of my career and, and I wanted that opening day start in 72 with home opener in Texas. And by golly, I got it. So, um, and then the other guy, the, the real sad story of course is Ron Mancine, who was one of the broadcasters. He had worked his whole life to get to do major league baseball, gets the job in 69 short, uh, replaced the, the older Dan Daniels and Bob Wolf. He replaced the, uh, that, that, um, team with Shelby Whitfield and Ron Mancine. And then, Three years later, it's taken away from him. And that's still, uh, Ron's passed away a few years ago. He became a friend of mine, but that left a, a, a scar on his, on his uh, soul very much. It still pained him a lot. You know, he said, I had three years of Major League Baseball and then it was taken away from me and never forgave Short for that. Um, so it was mixed. Uh, it was mixed. But I think for the players, you know, they have a job to do and they'll do it wherever you want them to do it. What happened to your ba- baseball allegiances when that happened? Did you follow the team still when they went to Texas? Did you kind of align or alight to the Orioles? Did you sort of just say, I'm done with this because my heart's been broken? What happened to you as a kid, baseball was? We still love sports, me and my friends. Um, so we, <laughs> we started um, loving any team that played and beat the Orioles. So uh, my parents are from Altoona, Pennsylvania. So um, I kind of adopted the Pirates as my National League team. And, of course, you know, me and my buddies were thrilled. They, they beat the Orioles in 71. And then in, uh, when we played Little League, the dads took us to a game in Baltimore. It seemed like the other side of the world against the Red Sox. And we rooted like crazy um, for the Red Sox. We were you know, stupid. Memorial Stadium was not a place where you should be doing that kind of thing. But I think we were kids, so they just humored us. And then when I got into senior year of high school, some of my buddies um, – got into Baltimore baseball and I would go to the games with them and Memorial stadium. When you're older is a fun, that was a fun ballpark. It was a good atmosphere and the Orioles had a good team. I never really got into them as a fan per se, but I, um, I enjoyed going to the games and, you know, felt like I supported them when they played the Yankees and other teams like that. Um, then as I got a little bit older out of, um, college, there was some there was some movement to get baseball back in DC, so they had um, a savings account you could put it for a deposit on tickets. Um, there was some movement maybe that Houston in the '90s was going to move to DC. They had those old timer games where you know Luke Appling hit the famous home run, um, and so as the years went by, I started getting more um, nostalgic about the '69 Senators and more hopeful and more wanting baseball to return. And when I connected with the DC baseball uh, history society, um, that was really the thing that changed me from following baseball as much as I did before to really getting into telling the story of the history of Washington baseball and helping to do what I could to get, get the game back. Um, and I think that 1998 reunion, that was really where the book took wings that the, the um, Washington Baseball Historical Society held for the 69 team. That's where I really got the bug to get baseball back. And um, like you read in the book, Ted Williams says at the end of that, that breakfast, um, he, he was ill, he was frail, but he came right at the tail end to give a, a speech and answer some questions. And he said, keep the faith about Washington because I can't think of a better place and probably the best place to have major league baseball come back. And that, really helped, I believe, get baseball back. 
six years later when they got the deal done in 2004. Because Ted, when Ted Williams speaks, baseball listens. And that was sort of a gift he gave Washington all those years later. Because if you remember, he was the one who first said, hey, these Negro League players are good and they ought to be in the Hall of Fame. And then it happened. So that reunion was, I think, a real turning point into getting um, getting the game back. The Nationals wouldn't probably say that. It's you know it, but I think Williams' quote there went a long way to getting some attention to say you know what this market's probably pretty darn good and maybe even though uh, Peter Angelos won't like it we ought to put a team there because we're going to make big bucks and and they have baseball has so uh, again Williams was the visionary and when he speaks people listen. All right, last question and then I'll let you promote. <laughs> Give me a sense. From your perspective, either in reality or perception, where does this second version of the senator's heritage, history, lineage, even stats, fandom, where, where does it live on? Is, is it gone with, you know, the franchise when it went to Texas? Is it inherited by the Nationals? you know, that are now there and, and how much reverence and or remembrance and or care does the current world champions uh, have for it? Or is it dispersed and, if you will, proverbially gone with the wind because it went so abruptly and there was no real sort of place for it to go, given all the people that short kind of turned off by departing? Sadly, Tim, they've kind of faded into a, a somewhat of a baseball black hole. Um, every once in a while, they, they come back. Texas owns the records. Um, apparently, they have a baseball museum, or they had one at their old stadium that had senators' um, memorabilia and, and records, but I've never been there, so I, I don't know if that's true. I don't think they ever wear senators' throwbacks. Um, the Nationals will from time to time. Um, Frank Howard has thrown out the first pitch at playoff games. Um, Dick Bosman threw out the first pitch at the last game at RFK. Um, so they, they, they'll acknowledge the Senator's history from time to time. Um, Frank Howard's on their, you know, their, their sports baseball hall of fame. Um, it's kind of a, a banner draped in front of a parking garage at the ballpark. Um, but, and there's, if you walk through, um, Nationals Park, you'll see some, you know, some pictures of the old senators. They tend to really promote the older version because they had a little bit more success. Of course, you'll see a lot of pictures of the 24 World Series. Um, but it's kind of arm's length. They don't really do a lot. You, there's no senators throwback night at Nationals Park. Um, a friend of mine uh, called them and asked them about that. And they said, well, you all are a small demographic. You're older. I mean, because, you know, I'm soon to be 58 and I'm on the young side of these fans that remember the team. And, and we don't really think that's the best way to grow a franchise. And I have to be honest, they're exactly right, even though it hurts a little bit. So and there's always there's this great uh, religious debate among national fans now of should they or should they not embrace the Expos records? I used to be pretty strong against it, but I'm kind of ambivalent now. My main thing is that I think even though that second iteration of the Senators, other than 1969, was a pretty sad history of dysfunction and, and losing, I do think they're worth remembering somewhere. And so I would like to see either the Rangers or the Nationals do a little more. I don't know that they will. There's really no money in it. But I'd hate to have this team lost to history. And that was one of the big motivations of, of writing the book. There were so many great stories, and these men were just fabulous people who they all overcame a lot to make it to the major leagues. Just one quick example, Dave Baldwin, he got released from the Mets' lowest minor league um, uh, franchise, Durham, like Class D in 1964. So most guys would have just quit, but he didn't, and he had to remake the way he pitched. He had to pitch sidearm because his arm – had been injured so much he couldn't pitch his normal way. He was a big star at the University of Arizona five years before that. Well, he remakes himself, and he gets back to the major leagues and pitches to an ERA under two for the 1967 Senators, plays enough ball to earn a pension. 
I mean, this is a, a story that needs to be told. And I just didn't want those stories to die. I mean, they, these guys fought through a lot to have the success they did that one season. And, and again, some of them went on to be world champions and play a big role in that. So I just thought they needed to be celebrated and not forgotten. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we've dealt with this sort of topic uh, elsewhere, other teams, other leagues, other sports. You know, it's not unimportant. Right. And, and sure, nobody wants to be proverbially associated with a quote unquote loser, obviously the, the economics around it and stuff. But that said, it's all part of the you know, the, the, the patchwork fabric of, of sports and, and it's messy, but it's also, you know, rip, uh, uh, ripe with, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, history and, 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 uh, you know, things that came before. Right. And I would argue you've got current generations of fans, uh, of any team or any sport and stuff. And, and it's always interesting as they get older or they go deeper into the story they sort of recognize that, you know, th- this franchise, this sport, this, whatever didn't just pop up overnight. There's a whole rationale for why this time and place exists where I'm in the stands and I'm enjoying this game or watching them on TV, right? And it's not just about making a buck. But yeah, I mean, I I understand both the sort of negative connotations, but I also very much, and and arguably this is partially why we do this show on some occasions, is to kind of not forget this stuff because it's all part of background. And you kind of alluded to it before. You sort of said it's, uh, it's kind of how history kind of does come around and repeat itself on a lot of different fronts. It certainly happens in sports, right? And I, you know, I, the joke I have sort of with 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 folks about this little show is that it's kind of evergreen because it's always there's always great stories that uh, uh, need to be remembered. But interestingly, there we're always making more. Uh, there's plenty of other leagues and teams and stuff that are going to go kaput for whatever reasons or or you know, and some of the reasons, the rationales are, are actually the same: economic and and political and. Uh, all of it. And um, I don't know, you'd hate to lose any of this stuff to history because the people in, uh, specifically involved with it, but but the team and the, the city, right? DC is not going away. And it's part of its sports, its sports history. And Tim, I think that's so important. Uh, I totally agree with you. I think as sports fans, as people and as a nation, if we forget our history, we're the poorer for it. And, and I'm really glad that you're doing your part to to keep the history of these teams like the Washington senators and others alive. Uh, I think it's very important um, that we, that we do that um, in so many ways. And you can see, you know, the consequences for sports and, and other parts uh, of the country of forgetting that. So thank you. All right. Our thanks to Steve and uh, the 69 senators. Who knew Uh, what a uh, uh, an interesting an interesting story on a lot of different levels uh, from a personal one, for sure. Uh, Steve's childhood, uh, who, you know, 1969 being a pivotal year, if you could call it that uh, for this franchise. And and, and arguably the uh, the seeds were sown uh, for its eventual uh, demise and departure uh, from D.C. And, you know, some of those wounds still linger, as you heard in the in Steve's voice and recounting and, and all the uh, the research done for this uh, this story. Uh, and it's a fascinating one. More to it. We just uh, proverbially scratched the surface. Uh, the book, of course, is a whole new ball game, the 1969 Washington Senators. And it's the uh, 50th anniversary edition uh, that came out uh, just last spring. And uh, you can get it a couple of different ways. The most direct way and frankly, most remunerative to Steve. And we, we like that. We want to we want to see Steve being as financially successful from his uh, from his work as possible, all you got to do is go to the uh, publisher's website. That's Polkel Press, P-O-C-O-L Press, polkelpress.com. And uh, just search up the book, A Whole New Ball Game. You'll find it. You can order it directly. I think you can even also uh, not only get the uh, paperback edition, but also uh, an electronic uh, uh, Kindle friendly version as well. Uh, if you're lazy, however, and uh, can't go to polkelpress.com and search it up, uh, you can go to our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com, where if you search up this episode, 170 is the number of it. Uh, you will find a convenient uh, link to that book that will take you to Amazon, where you can get it for a competitive price. And if you're lucky enough to be a Prime member, maybe the next day you'll get it uh, in your hot little hands, that paperback version, or more immediately, that Kindle version. Uh, of course, you can go to Amazon directly if you want, or, or wherever good books are found. Uh, and just uh, pick up a copy because uh, it, it's it's a fun read, and uh, it's a it's a great uh, encapsulation of 
of this team and frankly, what we're all about here on this little show. You want to follow Steve on uh, social media, you can do that. He's at 69 Nats fan. That's the number six, the number nine Nats, N-A-T-S fan, F-A-N, at 69 Nats fan on Twitter. Uh, you want to follow us on social media? Well, we're on Twitter too. We're at Good Seats Still. And uh, on Instagram, you'll find us at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you'll find us uh, on Facebook. There's a little page devoted to us. Just search us up there. And uh, all the other stuff you want to do with our little show, you can do that again on our website at goodseatstillavailable.com. You'll find all of those links. You'll find a convenient link to our email address. If you want to do that directly, then you can do that too. It's hello at goodseatsstillavailable.com. Uh, if you want to get our weekly email newsletter, uh, go to the website, just search up, uh, I think it's the follow button. One of the buttons there, you'll see it. There's a little convenient box. You just fill in your name and your your email address and we'll uh, we'll get you hooked up for every uh, Sunday. Usually we send out that note. It's just to give you a little heads up on what's going to be the next episode that week. What else? Jerry Payne, you know him, you love him. You can't live without him. And uh, Jerry Payne Audio Excellence is uh, the firm, and uh, it is also the uh, the expertise that uh, you don't uh, sort of overtly understand or hear, but uh, indeed, it is the only reason uh, that we sound somewhat uh, comprehensible uh, and enjoyable. Uh, Lord knows we uh, stumble our way through our episodes each and every week, but uh, Jerry does uh, a yeoman's-like job every week putting our pieces together, and we appreciate, as always, his fine services. I think that's it for this week. I don't have a clip for you at the end. I, we we uh, struggled mightily to see if there was a uh, second version of the Washington Senators theme song. There was none uh, to be had. And um, although I'm sure we'll get emails, somebody will have some audio clip or some kind of uh, ditty that they may remember, perhaps an old Warner Wolf uh, call in a game where he might have sung something. Who knows? But um, uh, during these uh, Senators years. But we appreciate your listening as always. Thank you uh, as always. Uh, take care. And uh, we'll uh, talk to you next week, God willing. And uh, until then, please be safe, everybody, and uh, we'll we'll see you soon. Bye bye.